Hello, I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to be talking about a game by the name of Bomb Squad. This is put out by Okazu Brand. It's a Japanese-only publication at this point, I believe, and it's designed by probably Japan's most famous contemporary board game designer, Hisashi Hiyashi, who has designed games such as Yokohama, Trains, Metro X, um, 5x5 City, and many others. Uh, and it is essentially, like I said, a cooperative bomb deduction game where players are going to be using limited information to figure out what tiles other players have on the racks in front of them. Plays in about 20 minutes per round, although it's mission-based, so once you complete one round, you'll go on to another harder challenge. There's 50 levels in the game, um, and it plays in about 20 minutes per round. Uh, sometimes shorter if you fail early um, and it plays between two and five players I've mostly played this I would say at two players it was definitely one of the uh, standby games that I've played during the pandemic but I've played it uh, certainly with four players and three players as well I haven't actually played it with five players yet but it is a game that whether you're going through the all of the missions or you are just using it you know to do a few one-off missions is really engaging and um, let me take a few minutes to show you how it plays and I'll come back and explain why I enjoyed this game so much. Bomb Squad is a cooperative uh, bomb defusing game that plays between two and five players and each player is going to get at the uh, start of most missions uh, one of these doubler cards as well as a uh, tile rack which they will then get these tiles which are numbered from 1 to 12, there's some special tiles in advanced missions. Um, they're going to then uh, look at them and put them into their tile basically from low to high order, and each player is going to do that. So the game plays from two to five players. You'll shuffle these up um, and then deal them out to the players as evenly as possible. Um, in certain lower player counts, in, for example, a two player uh, count, because there's 48 tiles, no matter how many, how many players you're playing with, each player is going to get two racks. So in a four-player game, each player would get one rack with 12 tiles. Um, you'll also then put a collection of hint tiles out, as well as four life tokens. And the game's going to go until uh, everybody's revealed all of their, um, their bomb tiles. Essentially, this is simulating the wires that have to be cut to defuse the bomb, or until you run out of life tokens, or in later missions until a bomb is revealed uh, by a player um, by accident. So, what you're going to do on your turn, starting with the person who has the leader card, is in the earliest mission, one of two things, which is basically do a cooperative defuse, where you're going to use one of the tiles that you know you have on your rack, as well as one of the tiles that you suspect that another player has uh, to try and ascertain what theirs are. Or you could do a self-diffuse, and I'll talk about that in a second. But at the start of the round, once all players have arranged their tiles and looked at them, oops, then you are going to be able to um, give, in clockwise order, starting with a leader, a hint about what your rack has. Basically, you could reveal one of these numbers to uh, all the other players. And that's where the hint tiles are going to come in. So you can see this player here has three ones. And everybody knows that your tiles are going to be on your rack from low to high. So it might make sense for this player to basically reveal that they have a one in their third position. And they'll do that by just taking a one tile and placing it on the far side of the rack so other people could see it that the tile in their third position is a one. And it's hard to see on camera, but maybe, for example, this player over here, maybe they want people to know that that one there is a seven. This player would get to tell something. Maybe they could say, oh, you know, I have a 12. My third tile here is a 12. And again, this might not track as well as you would think on, on camera, but in, in person, you could always ask, you know, which, which is this 12 pointing at, that information could be revealed again later, so it's not a problem in-game. And this player, their highest tile is a 9, so that might be good for other players to know, so they know that they don't have any 10s, 11s, or 12s, so they may reveal, I have a 9 here. Once everybody's done that, then the turns are going to begin. So again, starting with the uh, start player, the leader, they're going to reveal, or they're going to basically make a guess, or reveal some of their own tiles, and then each player clockwise is going to do that until the players win or lose. So a cooperative reveal is what you're going to be doing most turns, and what that means is that you are going to guess a number on a player's rack that you also have. And if you're successful, um, you'll be able to reveal those tiles, which is what the goal of the game is. So for example, 
this player here, because this player revealed that they have a 9 um, in their last position, could guess 9. So they might, what they would do is they would point at this player's rack, and they could point at the one that they know is a 9 and say, I think that this is a 9. Then this player, all they do is either, if it is a 9, reveal it, or if it's not a 9, all they do is they say it's not a 9. So if, the, if it wasn't a 9, they would say it's not a 9, and the players would lose one life token. Um, again, if they lose all of their life tokens, the mission would be over. But in this case, it was a 9, so they could just reveal that it was a 9, basically put the tile face down like that. And it's important that they're putting it down in position. So, for example, if they later revealed that this was an 8, and we had an 8 here and a 9 here revealed, we would know that this tile here would have to be an 8 or a 9. So that's where a lot of the deduction of the game, the trackable information comes in. You're not going to be writing things down in this game, but all the information will be visible based on the way that people are putting their tiles out. In any case, if, if this player revealed a 9, again, it's cooperative diffuse, so this player then could also reveal that they had a 9. Again, if they didn't have a 9, they wouldn't be able to guess 9. But that would end their turn, it would be successful, uh, they wouldn't lose a life token because of that, it would go on to the next player's turn. So, let's just say that um, this player here somehow guessed that this player here had a 7 and they revealed that. And then it came to this player's turn. Then they would be able to do the um, other type of action on your turn, which is a self-diffuse. And so... At the start of every round, there's going to be four of each number tile from 1 through 12. If ever you are dealt all four of them, it would be impossible for another player to guess your uh, number tile. So you could simply reveal all four of them as your turn action, say these are four threes, and put them down. Or, in this case, we already have two sevens accounted for, public knowledge, they've been diffused successfully. This player has the other two on their turn instead of guessing another player's uh, tile and doing a cooperative diffuse, they could just say, I have the other two sevens, and reveal those. So those are really the two main actions that you're going to be doing early on in the uh, the mission structure of the game. I, I should mention, I guess, now that the game has, I think, something like 50 missions in it, sort of like similar to games like The Crew, and those are going to get progressively harder. You'll read about those missions in the mission book. They have basically different requirements and different added challenges on them. So the, they start as easy as this, but then later there's going to be other complications. In any case, just in the basic you know, mission structure of the game, you'll just keep pro proceeding like that until all players have revealed all their tiles, or until all players have run out. At the, start of the, at the uh, starting missions in the game, each player is also going to, get, going to get a double card. And the use of that is, when you're doing a cooperative diffuse, you could say, you know, is one of these two tiles, and point to two tiles, a six, for example. And if one of them is a six, the player would be able to say, yes, one of them is a six, reveal it, and then, you know, you would successfully diffuse it. If both of them were six, you'd still only reveal one. If neither of them were a six, you would, you know, still lose a heart, but it could help you get out of a bind. They are, each player is going to get one of them in the starter missions, and they are one-time use for the mission. So, you know, once you've cleared the mission by revealing everything or fa failed, you'll either repeat the mission or go on to the next mission. So I'll just talk a little bit about some of the uh, way that the game wraps up difficulty be beyond that, because that's pretty simple. But it quickly gets pretty pretty complicated. So there's a little guide here that shows you what a mission structure means. And I should mention that the English rules for this are only available online. They're uploaded as a file onto uh, Board Game Geek. But you can see, for example, there's Mission 8 here which has a ban on the leader's hints. They wouldn't be able to uh, do any hints. And it also introduces a bomb tile. So the bomb tiles are probably the most important uh, thing. The bomb tiles, there's one of them for each for number from 1 through 12, and they have a value of 1.5 or 2.5, etc., all the way up to 12.5. And what those will do is, when you're, if you get dealt one of those, when you're figuring out your your low to high distribution, you would put that number as if it were any other tile. So for example, after the 9 would come to, and before the 10 would become the 9.5. If another player ever guesses this, and they say, you know, is this a 9? 
you would have to reveal, no, it was a bomb, and the players would immediately lose. That would be the uh, sudden death thing. And so it takes away some of the determinacy that is uh, that occurs during the round as things are revealed, because there could always be a half step between two numbers that you know. Um, and it creates this tension because there's su a sudden death aspect of it. You simply don't lose one life. Some missions you're going to know, you're going to go through these tiles of bomb tiles, and you'll say, okay, our bomb this time is a 3.5, so you'll be cautious around, you know, any that uh, around that range. Some of the harder missions, though, you'll simply take some, one or more of these at random and throw them into the pile of the 48 tiles and um, simply not know where the bombs are at all. And that, that you know, that's, that's more advanced. So that's one wrinkle that the game adds. Another wrinkle that the game adds is are these uh, star tiles. So these might be introduced into a mission, and you can see here that the star tiles, you know, similar to the bomb tiles, they have every number from 1 to 12, but they go 1.1 and 2.1. If you guess one of these and you're wrong, you don't, um, you don't automatically lose. You simply lose a life as if you guessed any number wrong. But they can only be diffused with another star tile. So there'll always be a multiple of two of these shuffled into the tiles. And if you were doing a self-diffuse, you would need to have all of them. Um, or if you were doing a cooperative diffuse, you would have to match your star with another star. Um, so for example, if this player had the 1.1 and they suspected that player had the 2.1, they would just point at that one and say, this is a star. If it was revealed as a star, they would get to reveal their star as well. So they don't, you don't, you're not really matching the number, just the, the star symbol. But again, they break up the, uh, the strict, you know, 1 to 12 um, progression on a thing. So they add challenge. And like the bomb tiles, they could be put in face down or face up. You may or may not know which star tiles you are dealing with. The, uh, I guess the third thing I'll explain as a... As a uh, extra challenge are these limiter cards. So there's cards here just simply for the 1 through 12 and based on the difficulty of the mission you might get a yellow or a red arrow and you might have multiple multiple limiters so there might be for and you'll basically take the arrows that the mission tells you so maybe there's a yellow and a red arrow and then you'll just take cards and put them out for the arrows and this will give you some additional rules. So in this case and let me just slide this up so you can see in this case, the additional rules would be that before you could um, diffuse any fours or guess any fours, you have to have at least one pair of fives visible. If you had the red arrow, for example, this would have this would mean before you could guess any fours, all four fives has to be revealed. So that's even harder. So those there could be one or more limits that are set on there. So between the limits, the bombs, and the stars. And you know the various rules, such as you know nobody gets to give a hint, or or certain players don't give to give a hint, or there might be a rule that one player's deemed high risk. So if they if anybody makes a mistake guessing their on their rack, the you know it's treated as a bomb and you instantly fail the mission. So there's definitely um, some more complications to it. Um, there are also helpful things that will come up in certain missions, such as these item cards and. Based on the emission, you might deal a certain number of these out. And these are actually in Japanese, although the name of the item is in English. So you'll quickly familiarize with the, yourself with these, although they are explained in the rule book. And they might give you different powers. So this triple just works like the double, except you get to point to three tiles and say, is one of these ti three tiles a four? And if one is, it would get revealed. That, that's how that works. Two numbers, you could point at a single tile and say, is this a four or a five? And these are generally uh, one-time use, although sometimes they're they are un unlocked only once you've defeat. So, for example, item number 10 will only get unlocked for use once a 10 has been successfully diffused across all of the player's boards. Same thing, you know, with the other numbers. So generally, that's how those work. All you get to say, do you have anywhere on your whole rack an 11? If they do, they'll reveal it. One life that would just uh, re let players flip one of their life tokens back over. So there's 12 of these that could possibly int be introduced into the missions. And you generally will get a, a number of these to help offset the added difficulty and give you more strategic options. So I would say that that's a pretty good overview of how the game works. Like I said, by the end of, of Mission 50, I could show you um, the game would have you with three unknown bomb tiles, four unknown star tiles, four of those limit cards, 
and you get six items and also you have to you know defeat the limit cards the way that those work is all of a has to be done before you go to b before you go to c before you go to d so it gets extremely challenging as you add in these extra rules especially because you're only getting a tiny bit of information at the start of the round so um yeah i think that that's a good overview of how you play bomb squad Okay, so that is Bomb Squad, and as you can see, the basic rules of this game are simple, and it seems like there's um, maybe not enough there to sustain you through 50 missions, but I can assure you, much like the trick-taking game The Crew, which is a similar cooperative experience played over many missions that get progressively harder, uh, this is one that I think has this addictive quality to it that, you know, once you clear a mission, you'll want to try the harder mission and, and keep going forward. Um, it's a kind of a shame that this has only been published in Japan. It's a nice little publication. It comes in a very tiny little box. The included tile racks are nice. I do kind of wish the tiles were slightly sturdier. They're fine, and um, we've played through the entire campaign of this, and they've held up fine, and they don't look especially scuffed or anything. There's no issue with being able to tell which tile is which. But I really wish that this game would get uh, another publisher that would... Uh, give it some, you know, sturdier components, you know, maybe, like, I know that there's, like, a, a Mahjong tile version of Hanabi, and I think this game would, would benefit from a similar treatment. It deserves that treatment, because, to me, this is a game that, you know, um, is been really overlooked just because of the virtue of it having originated in Japan, not having English rules in the box, although uh, the English rules are printable um, online. It's a nice translation. There's no problem with that. It's just because of accessibility, um, the game hasn't, I think, picked up um, the buzz that it really deserves. It, I think, technically came out in late 2020. I put it on my uh, best games of 2021 list, somewhere near the top of it uh, for the original games of 2021 it was one of the ones that really you know i enjoyed playing the most during the pandemic that's where i played this game the most and it's one that you know just feels like in a world where the crew is really a phenomenon and hanabi was really a phenomenon this stands shoulder to shoulder with those games both in terms of diversity of the uh, challenge that gets and the tension that you get as you're playing cooperatively i'm not necessarily a fan of co-op games but this is a one that i really like i like it more than i like a game like hanabi maybe not quite as much as i like the crew um but i like it more than i like hanabi because it really doesn't require you know too much memory. Um, certainly it would help you if you remember what, what numbers people are guessing because that's also an indication that they have those numbers. But a lot of the information that's given out during the round is trackable whether it's through those hint tiles or whether it's through the tiles that get revealed as people are making success, successful diffuses. So it becomes less an exercise of memory. Certainly though, like Kanabi, this is a game that you're going to develop um, certain um, tricks to give inf information to other players without, you know, just basically conventions that you'll be using without, you know, from game to game. And you'll get better at communicating with other players as a result. And that has that same satisfying feel to it. So if you like the crew or if you like Hanabi, I would definitely recommend importing this game. It's available from Amazon.co.jp, the Japanese Amazon site. And um, the last time I checked, they had you know, a few copies left, and the shipping was maybe 20 US dollars for shipping, so it was maybe about 40 US dollars, maybe 50 US dollars to get this, and if, you know, I know those games have a rabid fan base, and I, I can assure you that if you like those games, you would probably like this game as well. It's definitely not a game for everybody, and certainly if you haven't played The Crew, you haven't played Hanabi, those games are more accessible, I would suggest you get those first, um, but it is a game that, you know, I have really enjoyed having, um, and now I think over you know a year and a half, two years after its initial publication, there's no indication that anybody has picked this one up for publication. Unlike a lot of the other uh, Hisashi Hiyashi games, uh, they this one I don't see coming to the U.S. anytime soon. Hopefully I'm wrong though, because it's a game that absolutely deserves it. Um, I will say that um, I've enjoyed this game both as a campaign where we've played through the missions, you know, and kept 
pounding against them until we finally, you know, crack the code. Um, and I've also enjoyed it just, you know, to, as a game that you could show just a few missions off to people and treat it almost like a filler. And it, it works fine if you want to, you know, okay, we'll try mission one. Now we'll now that we get the rules, we'll go on to mission 10. And now let's try 15. And, you know, you complete those three missions and that's a satisfying, you know, hour or so of gameplay in and of itself. Um, so there is something to be said for it working that way as well. And really, you know, it's a game, like I said, I put this on my top games list last year, and I have no regrets about doing that. And like I said, it's just a game that I felt needed more attention then and felt that needed more attention now. Nobody has done a video, at least in English, on this as far as I could tell. So it was one that I thought I should shine some attention to. So hopefully at some point you'll find an opportunity to try or import Bomb Squad. Um, and yeah, and you'll see perhaps why, why I enjoy it so much. So those are my thoughts on the game and thank you for watching.